Hello, everyone. This is criminal profiler Pat Brown. And I have been asked to analyze the next interview done by the mom and the stepfather of Sebastian Rogers, the missing child who's now been missing three weeks um, from Tennessee. Um, and a lot of times I don't like to keep doing uh, analyses of interview after interview after interview. I try to only do it when I see something really worthwhile doing. And this particular interview, I did watch quite a number of times. And yes, there are things that bother me again in this interview with the mom and stepfather. Um, if you haven't seen my first interview, I'll link that below. It's called Red Flags. Uh, uh, and this interview, I find more red flags. Uh, in things that they say that are concerning. Now, let me say this. My analysis of what they're saying, it's a statement analysis. Uh, it doesn't mean I'm right. All right. Let's just be, let's just be honest about that. I can be wrong. Uh, I'd rather be wrong. And uh, Sebastian Rogers is alive and out there. They find him. These people have nothing to do with him going missing. Great. <laughs> That's a good thing. I'll take the hit. I'll take the hit. Um, but I've watched a lot of parents of missing children speak, and there are red flags that come up with this couple. Now, could the parents be weird, have strange ways of dealing with things? Yes, they could. And that, again, could mean they're not guilty of anything, but they just don't do well doing interviews. Uh, and they have a strange way of saying things that make things concerning, shall we say. Um, and I recommend to these two, maybe you need to stop doing these interviews uh, because I don't believe they're helping in any particular way. Um, two of you ought to be out there looking for Sebastian, papering the neighborhood uh, with all the flyers you can, talking to local business, businesses to get the, that information up. Uh, if, if the reporters want to talk to you while you're standing there and you just want to say, this is what we want to tell you about Sebastian, fine. But this second interview looks more like damage control, especially from the stepdad. It looks like damage control and not actually something to help find Sebastian. So what do, what do I mean by I think it's damage control? All right. And what do I mean by more red flags? All right. Well, they, they did something which maybe they should have done in the earlier interviews, which is show pictures of Sebastian and talk about Sebastian a little bit more. They do this in this interview and that part is good. All right. But what else do they do that bothers me? All right. The mom reiterates what happened that day. Uh, and some people say she doesn't look at the camera and she looks, you know, she's just looking down all the time. She could be medicated just to say she could be, she could be exhausted. So I'm going to give her a break on that. So she goes through the day again, uh, the, the day before he went missing and the, the morning that he supposedly went missing. And I have issues with many of the things she says. All right. As far as the moment she finds he's missing from the bedroom, supposedly at six o'clock in the morning she's changed the story a wee bit on what she did when she found he wasn't in the room. Originally, it sounded like she panicked immediately. And now she's saying, oh, you know, he could be getting snacks. He could be hiding behind walls because he likes to pop out and say, boo. Okay. Which one is it? You went into the room and you found he was gone. And you freaked. Or you just thought, where is he? I guess he's doing something else. And you wandered back through the house. Maybe he's getting making breakfast in the kitchen. Maybe he is getting snacks. Maybe he's in the bathroom. Maybe he's, maybe he, he could be doing a lot of things. And she says she, like in one minute, she's racing through the house trying to find him as if she is in a panic. But I don't understand why you'd be in a panic that quickly over a 15 year old. I don't because he could be doing all kinds of things in the house. I would just be, I would see he's not in the bedroom and I'd go and, you know, see he's not in the kitchen. I'd say, Sebastian, I might call his name out. Sebastian, what you doing? Where are you? I might go over to the bathroom to see, knock, knock. Is he in the, are you in the bathroom or you're not in the bathroom? Sebastian, where are you? I don't know how big their house is. So if there was a family room downstairs, I might say, Sebastian yelling down the stairs. I don't see that she's doing the normal things before the panic. Now, after you look through the house, 
he doesn't show up after five minutes, six minutes. Then you start going, where the heck is he? At which point I would get a little bit nervous and I'd start looking everywhere. If he's got autism and has some weird habits like hiding and things like that. Yes, I would look in closets and under beds and do that kind of thing, trying to find out where he is. She eventually says she opens up doors and yells out the doors and looks out the windows. I want to know, are you running around the house? Because I would be outside looking for him. Is he outside somewhere? I would be checking the vehicles. Now, I don't know if they have a garage or a vehicle in the garage or vehicle outside. I'd go to see if he's in the vehicle for some reason. Maybe he was getting some papers out of the vehicle. Maybe he did some weird thing. He's hiding in a vehicle. I check behind bushes. I, I, you know, depending on how the yard is, I'd be looking all around the yard and in the vehicles and in the garage at any place that he could be. I'd be panicking about that point, but I wouldn't panic right away because he could be anywhere in the house doing something. It would take me a, quite a few minutes before I'd panic for a 15 year old. Now, if the child were one years old, it would be a different matter. But 15, I'd be looking around, just yelling his name. Where are you, Sebastian? And then after I couldn't find him and he didn't show up, I'd start getting worried. Now, after she couldn't find him in the house, couldn't find him outside the house, he's not around. I get that she could, would call her husband and say, I can't find him. I can't find Sebastian anywhere. Then something else weird happens. They call, they call the police. Why aren't they calling Sebastian's dad? I mean, his biological dad who lives nearby. Why aren't they calling him? Because Sebastian spends supposedly every other weekend with the dad. And is supposedly, I've heard this, maybe going to live with him in the future. Uh, it's his son. Wouldn't you be calling up dad and saying, hey, you know, I can't find Sebastian. Did, did, he, did he call you? Did he come over to your house? I mean, did he... Do you think he's, did you come by? I mean, we're, she never calls or says she called the biological father, which to me is the first thing I would do when that kid went missing. I might call my husband. Yeah, because he's my husband, but I would call the biological dad just like that. And he's also works for the sheriff's department. So, Hey, so it's two birds with one stone that wasn't done. So that whole morning is questionable to me. Now let's go back earlier in the day. She goes through the things that happened during the day. And the one thing we do not have that I can't find out, I've looked at the website, uh, the, you know, the Tennessee Bureau of Investigation website, which the stepdad says we should go to because that gives us all the information. It does not. I do not know the exact last time that Sebastian was seen by someone or by video other than his parents, mom, the mom and the stepdad. The exact time. Because from that moment on, that's when everybody needs an alibi. Now, dad says, step, stepdad says something weird. He says, we've all been vetted, which is fine. But then he says, we've been cleared. I see no evidence out there that the police have said that these two have been cleared. Cleared is different than being vetted. Being vetted is what you do, uh, the, the the detectives are going to do this. They're going to check everybody that that has any connection to Sebastian to see where they were, what they were doing, uh, the neighbors, anybody Sebastian knows, everyone. They'll vet everyone they can. Uh, and if we're, especially for the mom and stepdad who the child lives with and the bio fa father, they're going to ask them for their phones and every, everything. Where were you? Where are your phones? Blah, blah, blah. They're going to look at them. They have to, that's what their job is. Everybody is a person of interest until you can exclude them until you can clear them 100%. There's no information out there that they have been cleared 100%. So I don't know why stepdad is saying that that concerns me. Um, how do you get cleared by the way? How, how does that actually happen? That happens that from the last time that child was seen by someone outside the family and or on video from that moment on until he supposedly disappeared that's when you have to have an alibi so i don't actually know when the last time sebastian was seen outside of the family home uh she does say they were out doing all kinds of things during the day and then they came home 
and they had dinner. So I'm going to say from dinner time on, it seems like nobody saw Sebastian except for the mom and perhaps the stepdad, which is another huge mystery uh, because the stepdad, I can't seem to get solid information is where the heck he was. Now, I know he goes out of town and stays out of town for sometimes a week or two at a time, but, and he was supposedly in Memphis, but when? I, originally, I had was under the impression that he was with them that day. And he even looks over during this interview about picking up a niece as if he were there. And then it seemed to me, from what I heard before, that he left for work, perhaps around nine o'clock that evening, somewhere in the evening he left for work and then drove down to Memphis. But I don't have that information. And they are so vague, which is odd to me. They're super vague about that because it would seem to me if he was down in Memphis and could not have been around to do anything to that child or to help move that child in any way. In that case, I would be shouting to the hills and I'd have her shouting to the hills that stepdad, Chris Proudfoot was in Memphis from, from, he was down there all week long and had not returned to the family home until he was called and told that Sebastian was missing, at which point he drove home. I do not see that information. Um, what, and when she talks about the day, she is very vague on the we. So I don't know why she would not be saying, if she was home just with Sebastian, he's out of town, I don't know why she would not be saying, well, um, my husband, Chris, Chris was out of town working in Memphis. He was, he hadn't been home for the last week. So Sebastian and I got up that morning. We, I made him breakfast. We went out and did these things during the day. We came home, we had dinner. Sebastian and I had dinner together. And then I told that Sebastian to go to bed at nine o'clock. But she uses this very vague we as if he's actually maybe in the home during most of this time and I are going and going with them. I can't figure it out because it's so vague. If you all know that a link, let me know. And interesting enough, one of the weird things that uh, Chris Proudfoot keeps saying is she says, I don't look at the internet. I'm just, I'm done with that. Good, good. She should be done with, she shouldn't be wasting her time carrying what I say or any other person says who's on the internet. But Chris Proudfoot says he's all over the internet, watching, watching, watching. Why? This stepchild is missing. What do you give a crap what I think or what anybody else thinks? Only person that matters as to what you think, I mean, what they think about you, will be the bio dad, your wife, the police, and maybe people in the community who you want help from. It doesn't matter what I say or what any channel says. And you're there paying attention. And even says, you can contact me and I'll answer your questions. Contact you where? He doesn't tell you where you're supposed to contact him at. And why would he want to answer random people's questions anyway? Who gives a crap what random people say? Chris, what does it matter? But okay, I'll throw out one question. Where were you the day before Sebastian went missing? Where were you? Were you at home for breakfast? Were you, did you go out to these different places during the day? Or did your wife go out with Sebastian? You stayed in the house? Were you there for dinner? Did Were you there in the evening when Sebastian was then supposedly told to go to bed and then you drove away? Where were you? That's the one question you don't seem to want to put out there. And I would think if I were out of town, I'd be shouting that to the hills just to make sure that people did not think I was involved in any way, shape or form. So if there's not proof that you were 100% out of town and never ever return from Memphis until that morning that you were told that Sebastian was missing. You do not have an alibi and you are not cleared. And neither is your wife. So, so I look back at that evening and I say, okay, if, if Chris was home, if he really was home and left at some point, then I find something rather interesting to me. They don't seem to be, they seem to be perfectly excited about people turning in videos. Um, uh, they weren't worried about the lights in the back, the lights in the yard. He says, oh, that's meaningless. And I think he may, that may be true. I uh, went to the website and the uh, TBI website. It did seem to say that they weren't overly impressed with the lights that maybe weren't even related to their backyard. Um, however, they don't seem to be terribly worried about 
uh, the movements that morning. So my question is this, either they have nothing to do with it. In other words, if their vehicles aren't seen running around, if mom's vehicle isn't like coming out of the uh, driveway at three o'clock in the morning, going somewhere and coming back, I don't know if they have any video that's and an, uh, an any kind of CCTV in that area, which would catch their, their vehicles. But on um, where, if you couldn't, if you, were, I don't know. I just don't know what the video situation is as far as coverage for proving that the two of them did not leave the home and put a child in their vehicle and drive the child away. Um, I don't know what they have for that. But here's what here's why I wonder if it doesn't matter. If stepdad was home that evening and he was going then to work on a, as he regularly would, drive down to Memphis, maybe leave at nine o'clock at night, drive down to Memphis, get him stay wherever he's staying. Who is to say that Sebastian was alive at nine o'clock at night if he left the house at that time? The, she's saying that they had dinner together. So the last, as far as I know, the, the last uh, known that Sebastian was alive and well, I don't even know when that exactly was. Late afternoon, early evening, I don't know. But at some point, they were alone in the house. If something happened to Sebastian at eight o'clock at night, nine o'clock at night, 10 o'clock at night, whatever. She's been saying he go, he went to bed at nine. But that's, if he went to work at nine, it doesn't mean that he couldn't have left with Sebastian in his vehicle. And then she claims after he's already driven off to Memphis, she claims to the in the interviews, I told him to go to bed at nine, meaning he was alive at nine o'clock. And now she's added something in this interview, which I find interesting. She didn't say it before. She says she heard noise in his room at 10 o'clock. She said, well, stop doing that. Get, 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 you know, stop doing whatever you're doing. Go to sleep. So now she's trying to indicate that he's alive at 10 o'clock at night. Is that again because she wants to make sure everybody thinks he was alive somewhere at that point in time at night, uh, in the evening, in the, in the later evening? She wants people to believe he's alive because if he left the house, if he drove away at 8 or nine o'clock or nine thirty or whenever, she would want to make sure everybody thought he drove away, and then Sebastian was still alive. But what do I know? He will not. He does not seem to want to say where he was, and the police have. I don't think the police have made it clear that he was not in town that that day and evening uh, before Sebastian was known to be missing. I don't understand the silence on that. Um, and that doesn't make you look good. And so this is the kind of things that if you're going to do interviews, you either you, you either want to focus just on the kid and not tell stories that you keep changing and not have information that isn't there that people are suspicious about because you don't want to talk about it for some reason, which makes little sense unless something is not quite right. Um, and to say you're cleared when the police have not said you're cleared, to say that you're concerned about what people are saying about you on the internet and you're spending time doing that is not a very good look either. And you wonder why you care. So these are the red flags for me that have popped up in this particular, um, this interview, her changing story about the morning that she went to find him and the fact that she's so quickly upset rather than looking around for the child who she now says hides behind things and gets snacks and does all kinds of stuff in the morning. So why wouldn't he be somewhere else in the house? Why would in 60 seconds, would you freak out? So her story is strange. Uh, we don't know the exact last time Sebastian was absolutely seen. I haven't seen that exact number. I don't know where the stepfather was that day or evening. And I don't know whether it's possible that the child left in the stepfather's vehicle that evening. And that's why once he's out of town, Nothing matters after that. What, pe what people's videos show, what, what lights are rolling around, nothing matters after that because a child is not in the, a child is already taken away. Um, uh, I'm not saying these things happened, but I'm saying this is what the interview makes it look like to a profiler. And I would think to a detective, detectives watch these interviews as well. So you're not doing yourselves a lot of good. If you're innocent people, stop doing interviews like this because it, it's, you're not clearing things up. You're making things look worse. Um, 
I just, oh, I say again, one the other thing that just went back in there bothers me is that she didn't call the, the biological father, didn't call Sebastian's father when she couldn't find him. You would think she'd call right away and say, hey, do you have, is he at your house? Did he call you? Do you know anything that's going on? And she didn't do that. That says something to me. Uh, so those are all the things that bugged me uh, in this, uh, this new interview. I'll stop there. Uh, whether I'll speak on this case again, I don't know. It again depends on what, what they find out. It's been three weeks now. Sebastian's been missing. Chances of being alive are not good. Why? Because he doesn't have any money. He doesn't have the ability to survive on his own. So if he really did run off, he either did come to some bad end very quickly, like you know, somehow fall into some water somewhere and drown. And he's been he's been dead since day one. Um, it's just not able to be found because they just haven't looked in the right place yet. That would be nobody's guilty of anything. The child just did some strange thing that you wouldn't expect, or at least they didn't expect he would do. And uh, and he's not with us anymore. Um, or if he went to meet somebody, who is this person that he's meeting? Apparently not one of the other children in school. So it would have to be an adult of some sort who is harboring him. And they never ask for him to be that's the other thing. They never say, you know, they keep saying, come home or we'll find you. But they never say, if you have my son, let him go. Drop him at a gas station. Let him go. They never offered a reward. I just, it's it's weird. Um, they're also not sitting down with the bio father. Because to me, it's a strong front. If all three of you trust each other and you think the child really did walk off, all three of you should be sitting there together. And you're not. So either you think the bio dad took the child or the bio dad thinks you did something to the child. So. Uh, but you're not asking for him to be returned. You're not asking for somebody, if you have our son, let him go. You're not saying that. So, and that's weird because that's, if he didn't, if he went with somebody, somebody either has him or has killed him. It's the two choices. Where else, was, where else is he going to be? It's very frustrating. So anyway, yeah, um, I'll stop now. <laughs> um, but yeah. Anyway, uh, we'll talk about this again if there's something to say. Um, if you're new to the channel, please do like and subscribe. Uh, check my playlist for other cases as well. Uh, and yes, I will put the first interview in the link below. Um, so, and I'll put the, the link to this uh, interview as well so that you can see what I'm talking about in case you haven't run into this particular interview. So um, thank you for being here. And um, yes, I do hope Sebastian is alive and I hope that uh, yeah, I, you always hope that. Yeah, there's no other way to say it. You always hope that. And I say as a profiler, this is an educational channel. I'm trying to tell you, I'm trying to show you how a profiler would think, how a detective would think. This is not a news channel or a gossip channel. I'm trying to explain how, how one analyzes crime. But one can be wrong. And it's okay if I'm wrong. Uh, I say it would be a better thing. <laughs> it would be a better thing. Uh, not for teaching education, but for, for the sake of a, a, a young child who had his whole life ahead of him or has his whole life ahead of him. And we'll see. So thank you for being here. Bye.